It has been one year since Kathy Hochul took over the New York governor's office. Since then, she's dealt with several unanticipated crises, from mass shootings to natural disasters. Our Marsha Kramer sat down with the governor to talk about it all. Here's her one-on-one. -on -one. So, Governor, before we get started talking about your first year in office, I wanted to ask you about something that's in the headlines, uh, the buses that have been arriving from Texas with asylum seekers um, being sent here. Um, I wonder, you know, if you're concerned about the burden it's placing on New York City and if you've had any conversation with the governor of Texas about what's going on. Well, of course, you should not be using human beings as political pawns, which is exactly what's going on. Uh, I've not spoken to the governor. I've actually gone even further, and I've spoken to the Secretary of Homeland Security to talk to him about getting support for Mayor Adams' request for federal assistance. And we actually found an another pot of money that we think can be deployed to help the situation when they arrive. You know, we welcome. We made the uh, the Port Authority terminal available for a welcome center. We have our Office of New Americans on the ground to help people become assimilated, as well as uh, you know, continue to pressure for more federal assistance. So, uh, so it's a challenge. But just spoke to the ma mayor of New York about it yesterday, and uh, Homeland Security in Washington. So, so we're playing a role to be supportive of the efforts to take care of these people. Do you think that there will be federal money coming? There is some federal money. There's a pot of money coming. There's another source of money that I've identified that we can be applying for as well. Any dollar sign you'd like to share with me? No, you have to apply, and then you find out what they give to you. So, uh, so we don't have that yet. So I wonder also if you've spoken to the president about maybe doing something. What I think could be enormously helpful, again, this is a federal decision. I put in a request for there to be some sort of possibly executive action that allows individuals who come here to have the ability to at least get a, a temporary work permit. I don't know that that's been done, but if there's some action that we take in Washington that authorizes me to do it, I will do it as governor because... You know, people come to this country in search of the American dream. What does that dream include? It includes the opportunity to lift your family up through a good job. And we have thousands of jobs here, not just in the city, but all over New York, uh, where people just you know, become participating members of society very quickly, even while they're waiting their legal determination. So I'm waiting an answer on that. I think that'd be positive. But in the meantime, you know, we just have to say, you know, these are human beings. Are you going to sign an executive order to give them work permits? I can't do it independent of authority from the federal government. That's, that's exactly what, what I have to wait for. So yesterday we obtained troubling video of asylum seekers getting off five buses at the Port Authority bus terminal wearing barcoded bracelets. The city was very upset about that because it, they said it was an indication of them being treated like cattle and um, there, and it was inhumane. I wonder how you feel about that, the, this practice of barcoding them and then before they get off the bus, cutting them off so you can't see it. These are human beings. No one deserves to be treated like an animal. And we're going to continue to do what we can to support them, to support the mayor in his efforts, and also ensure that the federal government is able to assist with financial resources and the possibility of jobs. And that's that's what we're doing. I mean, it, it is a disgrace. It is a disgrace. Uh, Do you think it would be helpful to talk to the governor of Texas now? I'm not sure what that would accomplish. I tend to talk to anybody where I think there'll be a productive outcome. So talking about another issue and another governor, congestion pricing and Governor Murphy, who's been threatening to use veto power of the minutes at the Port Authority to try to stop congestion pricing. I wonder if you think it's an idle threat or if it's a real threat, and if you've talked to him about um, what's going to happen. Well, congestion pricing has been discussed for a long time, and we have a situation now where we have far more vehicles in Manhattan than we even had before the pandemic. I mean, the vehicles are here, but only 8% of people living in Manhattan actually own and drive vehicles. So there's a different dynamic going on here when it's having negative effects on our environment. Let, let's deal with that reality. And we need a funding source to support capital improvements to the MTA to make sure that a 100-year-old system is there for the next 100 years. But of course, the way I operate, the way I've been running government for a solid year now, is work with people. So the governor and I have been in communication with each other. We're going to sit down with our senior teams, talk about what's, we're going, what's going on. And there's conversations, you know, a lot of inputs being received from all stakeholders. And tonight is the first of a series of public hearings 
That's part of the process. There's going to be at least five days of hearings. Then the Traffic Mobility Board will be, Review Board will be analyzing this. So, so it's, it's all about gathering data and making the right decisions. But have you talked to the governor about the possibility that uh, New Jersey drivers who go through the Holland and Lincoln tunnels, which go into the Central Business District, might not have to pay an extra fee because they already paid the fee to take the tunnel? I've not dealt with that specific question. I know that's on his mind, and we have a conversation that's forthcoming. Is there a way to find a, a way to get him on board? <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we'll see. But again, this is not a new topic, and it's also to protect those who are drivers in the city because there's just too many right now. We need to start uh, getting more people on public transportation. That is the beauty of this region is that we have so many, we have an abundance of public transportation options, and it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we're investing in those so they don't become uh, unusable in the future or subjected to you know storms. We have to build resiliency like we saw with Sandy. You can't have the system shut down. So, so it's a complicated issue. Not an easy answer, but we're heading down a certain path that's going to take even more time. But I will have all the conversations that need to be had on this. The reason I'm asking the question, because also your uh, Republican opponent in the gubernatorial race is trying to use that to curry favor with suburban voters. Is there something you would like to say to suburban voters about why it's important to have congestion pricing? We have a crisis in the city of New York right now. Um, part of it has to do with the fact that there are more vehicles driving the seats, streets of Manhattan. And I walk the streets every day. I know how congested it is and what that means to just everyday life and to businesses that aren't functioning because the delivery trucks can't get in and out. I mean, it, we're in a paralysis situation. So we have to make sure that we address this and I will continue to focus on doing the best we can to alleviate a difficult situation using all the tools at our disposal. They don't want to pay the toll. They don't want to pay congestion pricing. And we don't know how much it's going to be, and we also are working on investing in more opportunities for people to have public transportation, I mean, making it easier. I just, out in Long Island, talking about finishing up the third track, you know, going from 600 trains to 900 trains. So we're, we're inviting everyone to look at what other options are out there that they may have either taken in the past but stopped during the pandemic because we are seeing an increase in riders or that they had never entertained before. So I'm asking everyone to be open-minded in terms of what is out there available. This area is known for um, reliable, high-quality public transportation. We can always do better, always improving it, but that's other parts of our state, other parts of the country don't have anything near what we have in terms of being able to get people where they need to go affordably, very affordably, and the cost of driving into the city, the cost of parking versus our subway fare or bus fare, there's no comparison. So people are concerned about the cost of congestion pricing. Their whole driver experience is the far more expensive option as well. So these are the conversations that we're having now. Did you ever wish you didn't have to talk about it during the gubernatorial campaign? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of issues uh, in the governor's job is to just deal with them as they come up, whether you inherit an issue, whether it's uh, a new one that falls in your lap, it's a responsibility to govern uh, the governor to work so on. So you've now been governor for a year. What was your best day? First day. Uh, it was a first day. It was extraordinary to be able to step in that position and to walk into the red room and look out at my family and particularly my daughter. Uh, who had always encouraged me to run. I've been running since she was a preschooler, and my son and his wife and her husband. It was such a, and my father, who uh, was 85 at the time, able to be gathered, my husband, who's been so supportive. To me, it was personally uh, a day of um, unexpected day, but one where I felt the weight on my shoulders immediately, but I also knew immediately that I could handle that weight. It wasn't too much for me, and I needed to prove that as the first woman ever to hold this job, that I could do this, in a way that responded to every crisis with the toughness and the strength that is required to govern a state as complicated and rough and tumble as New York, but also with something else, and that is heart and compassion and an empathy for people. So I'm touched deeply by New Yorkers when I see them in pain you know, after a mass shooting in Buffalo or a subway shooting, a mother in a hospital wondering the fate of her son as I held her hand and she didn't know any English. I mean, these are the moments where I feel that I can really take this to a different level where people start to believe in government again. Uh, that belief had been shattered for a long time and that's why that first day uh, was so significant and, and I'm always going to be humbled by the privilege of being the governor of New York. What was the worst day? 
uh, probably the day we lost our lieutenant governor, uh, um, and also that was the subway shooting the same time, uh, within an hour of each other. Uh, a lot of bad days. That, that was a tough one, uh, and more so just going to a site and having to speak to people about the, the incredible stress they're under. It when must they be really saw that. hard for you to have to talk to people who've suffered loss and have had to go through that. A lot of people have cried on my shoulder. Uh, and I went up to Buffalo after 10 of my neighbors were gunned down, shopping a store and um, holding a three-year-old whose father was there shopping to buy a birthday cake for him and he never came home. And he's walking around saying, where's daddy? Um, it's emotional, but you also have to draw on that strength that I know all women have that's deep down. When you have to rise up, you do, and you deal with the emotion, but also that is overwhelmed with the strength to carry on and to fix a situation. That's what I'm focused on. I wonder if it was hard to step into Andrew Cuomo's shoes. I knew I had it to change an entire culture, top to bottom. I walked in not having a built-in team, a very small group of people. Uh, we had to deal with the hurricane in the first few days. I had to deal with rent relief because so many people were struggling. We went from the worst in the nation and getting COVID money out to the best. So I had to deal with a lot of challenges, issues, even uh, cannabis. You know, the whole process to legalize marijuana was jammed up. So I had a lot of work to do. So I never thought about, you know, the shadow of someone else because this was what I was called to do. I was the person at the time who had served eight years as lieutenant governor. I knew exactly what was required, and we just rolled up our sleeves and got to work. What did you think of him? I thought that he was a strong leader at a time when we needed the strong leader, but also, you know, had a lot of, you know, personal issues that, you know, that then now there's consequences. And so he made a decision. But, you know, I worked, I worked in this administration focusing on what I could do as lieutenant governor, but also, um, you know, we have standards. We have, you know, we, we have to create a culture of respect for people and women in particular. So this is personal to me as someone who's worked in politics since I was a young woman. So yes, I, I, we needed to say, this is a new era, there's a new culture, and we're doing things very differently. Did you have a different view of him before the sexual harassment charges came out? I was never aware of anything going on. So yes, I think just like all New Yorkers, uh, it was stunning in its revelations. Yep, absolutely. You were surprised. Yes, yes I was. So um, there were a number of, you've had to take over um, the COVID crisis, which is ongoing and seems going to be here for a while. I wonder though, um, if you take a look at the nursing home situation, would you have done it differently? Well, it's hard to know what we'll do in the moment, but the decision to have people who were sick with COVID return to a vulnerable situation, it's hard to think that people would want to do that again. Uh, that, that, uh, that is part of what we'll be analyzing when we do our report that I initiated and we have people that are being uh, reviewed. You know, the RFP was out, we're identifying consultants and people to start a process to look at every part of the pandemic. So there's a playbook left and it's also looking at what happened in shutting down the businesses. You know, what help was needed? Would you do that again? Would you shut down schools again? I think the resounding answer is no. You have to figure out how to keep these kids in a learning environment, protect them, but my God, we're still dealing with the fallout for a generation of kids who lost two years of growth. And we have a lot of mental health challenges and suicide is up. And so the collateral damage of that decision, and it wasn't just New York, but it just that, that's still pain that we're dealing with today. So you would have done a lot of things differently. It's always easy to be an armchair quarterback on say things, but what I know about people, and had I been in that moment, we would have looked at things from a different perspective and, and partly was also involving local governments. Our local health departments were not engaged. I saw this because they're begging to be involved because this is what they trained for. They're the ones who know how to give out the vaccines. They know how to deal with uh, health. They've done this through other crises and, and it became very top-down driven. And as someone who was out in the field at the time, I saw that there, there was a different approach to that that was more inclusive and, and listen more to the people on the ground. You know, one of the big changes um, after you became governor 
was the fact that you actually have a great working relationship with the mayor of the city of New York. How important do you think that's been in terms of the city and the state and moving everybody forward on a lot of key issues, not just COVID? It's made all the difference in the world. And it's not that complicated. I, I work with Mayor de Blasio in his final months. We were trying to deal with the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. We teamed up together, went to the sites, got money on the ground. Uh, we worked on public safety issues, and then, uh, as I mentioned uh, when I was with Mayor Adams on his election night, I said, we need to let people know that the days of us fighting, our positions fighting, are over. Instead, we're going to fight for the people we represent. I was with the mayor yesterday, talking about and being highlighted by the head of ATF about the collaboration between state police, our resources, pulling together with NYPD and our intelligence gathering, with not just the city, but nine states that I pulled together, first time ever. And the head of ATF said, this is extraordinary. We need to do this elsewhere. So it's, it's about relationships. So I, I get along great with selected officials. I'll have a good relationship with the mayor going forth. We'll solve problems together, work with the legislature, work with governors of other states. And all those relationships mean that, yes, we're moving ahead on Penn Station. We're moving ahead on Gateway Tunnel. We're working, moving ahead on things that have been jammed up for no reason that other than well, it's obvious. Competition, I guess. I don't know. I, I think it's obvious that your um, ability to get al along with people, let's put it that way, has um, a lot allowed a lot of things to go forward that were stuck for a long time. I think they've gone forward, but also there have been plenty of times when I've had to be very firm. I mean, getting along with people doesn't mean I, I, I uh, concede. I've had a lot of strong battles, but what you don't see is them played out in epic fashion uh, where there's this clashing going on because you know what that does? It makes people anxious. People don't want to see their elected officials. Obviously they vote for me, they vote for uh, the mayor as well. They want us to work together. So we're delivering people to people to the service and the relationships that they want to see but that doesn't mean getting along means that you know, But it's you clearly your personality but also I think it, does, it seems to me that you may have made a concerted effort to not have public fights with people and to try to work things out um, behind the scenes. That's right, and I don't have to have a headline saying I won that battle uh, because then there's winners and losers. I have been very successful in achieving my, my objectives. I feel good about that, but I need individuals who may not be thrilled with me getting something one day. I may need them on my team or on my side on another issue. You know, relationships with the legislature are important. Uh, we got a lot done in the budget that we needed to get done. There was some resistance. The budget was laid for one reason and one reason only, was I had to break through that resistance. But in the end, we had to work together at the end of session as well. So there was still a relationship where we could say, okay, look what the Supreme Court just did. We need to get back here quickly in, in an extraordinary session after everyone thought they were done and fix what the Supreme Court did on the concealed carry law. And that'll be announced. You know, we, we changed the laws. I just had a meeting again today to talk about our implementation to make sure that there are safe places in New York City where someone cannot be carrying a gun, including the subways and our parks and our places of worship and our schools and even Times Square. So I've been working on this, but if I had... Does that go into effect in September? September 1. I'll be doing a press on it uh, August 31st. We have videos out there explaining everything, uh, public relations, messaging campaigns. So people know that I take the safety of New Yorkers very seriously. And so if I had damaged relationships with the legislature during the budget process and, you know, I won, you lose, you know, it doesn't get us where we need to go the next day, the next day. And that is how I view the job in the long, I look at the long game. Relationships matter. I just wonder if you feel some sympathy for Mayor Adams, who basically ran promising to make the streets safer and has had a really difficult time mm -hmm. doing that, and this constant drumbeat of bail reform. I wonder if that frustrates you, because y you have made changes to the bail law that people don't seem to understand. Right, and we did take into consideration you know, the need to have public policies that made sure we had a just system, but also Sometimes things swing too far. You know, we, we now have judges able to consider other factors and that repeat offenders who are terrorizing our little stores. And I've walked to talk to shop owners everywhere from 
you know, East Elmhurst to East New York to the Bronx. I'm everywhere. And we needed to change the laws to protect them. And cases where there's a gun involved, make sure that that person can be held. So we just injected common sense back into it. But listen, it doesn't help for me to, you know, criticize. Uh, the mayor has a perspective. We came together yesterday talking about our joint effort to get more guns off the street, over 6,000 guns off the streets. And that's the partnership that I'm going to continue to develop and, and strive for. So what does Kathy Hochul do for fun? Uh, I like to walk. Uh, when I'm in the city, you know, there's not a lot of fun time. But if I have to go to a meeting, I'll, I'll, I'll walk around all the time. You know, people don't know it's me out there because I'm short and kind of slip in and out. But I put on a baseball hat and a ponytail, and I, and I just walk around. Uh, the other night, it was a beautiful sunset. I took the ferry down to Wall Street, just got out with all the tourists, took the ride. I decided I'm out your, there. Your security detail must be thrilled with you. Uh, they, they, I say, don't you signal it's me here, because uh, you know, they, they do their jobs. They work very hard. But I, I, I like being out with people. I was thrilled to be at the, uh, the Farmer's Market. I go down to Union Square. I go over to uh, um, Grand Army. I go, all, I go all over the city, and I go to fun little restaurants and quirky places, and I, I call up elected officials who represent, you know, I was just at uh, the Jackson Diner, the, probably the most diverse intersection in the world. I was there with elected officials and having great food. And so that to me is fun. I mean, still, it's partly the job because it's about showing up and showing you're still engaged, but I don't have to do something where I shut down from my job and go do something else. I'm energized by this job. So when you're off duty, I mean, what does Kathy Hochul wear? What does she eat? What does she like to do? We want to know all uh, about the The basic you. would be, uh, a T-shirt with the logo of some part in the some part of the state, because uh, I collect all these. T-shirts. How many T-shirts do you oh, have? Hundreds, hundreds of T-shirts, hundreds. Of t I just picked up a few more yesterday from Basilio's Italian Sausage Stand. They've been around 65 years at the at the state fair, so I now have a Basilio's Italian Sausage. Uh, so I have everything. <laughs> I I have a great collection. So I, pair of jeans, T-shirt, jeans. Uh, How do you pick the T-shirt? Put the sneakers. Hmm? How do I what? How do you pick the T-shirt if you have hundreds? Oh, I, I just yesterday I just I feel like wearing Saranac Lake, and then I wore Brooklyn the other. I, mean, I just I just I just pull it out of the drawer, and so uh, I'm a very casual person. Uh, I go to restaurants usually that don't have white tablecloths. So I like to sit in diners. I like to sit, and you know, I and I enjoy the whole city. But uh, if you ask me, I'm going to be out there just, you know, having an ice cream cone with a bunch of kids in a park. I mean, I went to a park on Bayside the other night. I went to a concert and. You know, it was all little kids running around. Someone walked up and put an ice cream cone in my hand, and I was happy <laughs> playing all these music. And so I, I've, I get energy from seeing people, and so I need to be out there. And your favorite flavor of ice cream is? As much as you can ramp up the taste of chocolate, like if it's <laughs> double brownie fudge, something or other, uh, that is heavenly to me. So the reason I'm asking these questions is because many people because you've been in office only, not only a year, it must have been like an amazing year, they want to know more about you. So if you could tell our viewers something about you that they don't know, what would you say? I don't view myself as any more important or significant than anybody else I meet. When people say to me, you work so hard, you're, I look at your schedule, you're everywhere. I said, you know who works hard? The people who clean my hotel room and then go take care of their kids, and then go to a class at night, and then check in on their parents. I mean, people in New York work hard. So I don't want anybody's sympathy about how I throw myself into my work because this is a passion for me. I'm energized. I love what I do every day. There's, that's why when you say, is there a bad day, it's almost hard to think of a bad day because every day gives me an opportunity to prove to New Yorkers they have a leader who gives a damn about them, who genuinely cares. And I don't want, I want to change people's perceptions of their elected leaders, you know, one person at a time, and especially women leadership. If I can make people feel that they're in really good hands, uh, even perhaps better hands, with the woman at the top, that opens the door for the next generation of little girls that are out there watching to see what I'm doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcia.